much more abundant than today, coaster brook trout were once a much sought after sport fish. We'll take a look at some of the efforts being made to rehabilitate our coaster population. Then it's off to Little Beatty Knock for a look at some similar work being done to help gather information about walleyes. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you by Cooking Wild Seasonings. Make it fresh, make it yours. Electrofishing is a common scientific survey method used by the Department of Natural Resources to help get a better picture of what a particular stream holds as far as fish, species, strain, and size. I tagged along with Michigan DNR Fisheries Division fisheries biologist Troy Zorn and crew on a coaster brook trout project. Coaster brook trout are tributary brookies that spend part of their lives in the bigger waters of the Great Lakes. Because of that, they can reach much larger sizes than their stream-bound siblings. When these brook trout mature, they return to the stream to spawn. Once abundant and widespread, coasters became a highly sought-after sport fish. Unregulated fishing decimated coaster stocks in the mid-1800s, and numbers were further reduced by stream habitat loss. In an effort to increase the size of coaster brook trout, special size limit restrictions and bag limits have been placed on various UP streams. Brookie 9.2. These streams are then monitored and information is collected to help determine the success of these regulations. Scales. One of the methods used to collect the necessary information is electrofishing. So we have a 1,500 foot reach of stream that we're electrofishing and we're going to be catching all the cell, we're catching everything we see measuring brook trout, we're going to take some scale samples for aging, and then we're also going to take a clip of the maxilla bone off of the fish, and we're going to analyze that, and we can look at the chemical signature on that bone. You can look at that chemical signature on the bone as the fish ages and see if it has a lake superior chemical signature and a stream chemical signature. And then if we see that, we can say, yep, that's a coaster brook trout. Um, the reason for doing that is kind of a management application. So we survey the stream once every three years. If we catch a 14-inch brook trout, Rainbow 5.4. we won't know just from catching it if that fish has actually migrated out to Lake Superior and come back in the river or if it's just a large stream fish. But by taking that maxilla and analyzing the chemical composition, if we see a Lake Superior signature and a stream signature, we can say, yep, that fish was a migratory coaster brook trout. And so that will either allow us to, to make a more informed decision on whether the regulation is producing what we're hoping it might or if it's not really making a difference and it's really just making bigger stream brook trout. So that's kind of what we're up to. We've got two backpack shockers. So they're um, 12 volt pulsed electrofishers. Um, basically they run on a 12 volt or a 24 volt battery um, and it converts the electricity into a form that works really well for stunning fish. Electrofishing is a great tool for sampling fish populations because they actually respond very strongly to electricity in the water. So basically we have a probe, which is the positive end of the system, and then a ground on the back end, which is the negative. And when we uh, turn them on, it creates an electric field in the water around the probe and the ground. As the fish approach the outer periphery of the field, it actually forces the fish to swim uncontrollably towards the electricity. Um, and as it gets closer to, to the probe or the ground and in the field, um, say stronger, it basically paralyzes the fish um, momentarily. So it gives us just enough time to net them all the water and then we pass them off to the person who processes them. And then almost immediately upon returning the water, they come back to and just swim away. It actually doesn't harm the fish, it just stuns them momentarily and then we can release them back into the water without any permanent damage. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you in part by Blades Bait and Tackle, your hard water connection to Little Baby Knock. This project got started. I heard a presentation at a meeting um, about five or six years ago. Minnesota DNR had put a special regulation on the lower part of their tributaries to Lake Superior that drain in from the North Shore, and they put a, 
a 20 inch minimum size limit and a one fish bag trying to rehabilitate coastal brook trout. After 10 years, they started seeing brook trout of a size and age that they had not seen previously. So they were getting Lake Superior brook trout coming into their streams, suggesting that harvest might be what is limiting those populations. That got me really interested in doing it. And in Northern Ontario, they also use a protective regulation and they were seeing their coaster populations rebuild. So I thought this might be worth trying in Michigan. So we shopped the idea around, got a lot of support for it. And we have eight rivers where the lower portion of the river we put the same regulation on that Minnesota did. It's a 20 fish, 20 inch minimum size limit for brook trout and a one fish bag. So it's basically catch and release. We're expecting, hoping that maybe 10 years down the road, we'll start to see some larger size coaster type brook trout come in. And so we're evaluating these study reaches and also some other reaches where we don't have the experimental regulation on. They're the control reaches. And we're gonna compare and see how the responses over time uh, differ between the reaches with the regulation and those without it. Yeah, that first one's a little coho. This is a coho. These are juvenile coho salmon. They got real vertical marks. These are par marks. See that hook on the tail? That's a good diagnosing thing for a juvenile coho. Right there, not on the tail, but see that little fin at the bottom, the anal fin? So that's a juvenile coho salmon. So we'll just get a length on those. So I guess what we're catching is not too unusual for a lot of small cold water tributaries to Lake Superior, and at least in the Marquette Barriga County area that I've sampled. A lot of juvenile coho, a lot of juvenile rainbow, some brook trout, not tons. Actually, several of the streams with this regulation are kind of marginal or maybe even too warm for year-round trout use, but one of the theories for what stimulates the coastal brook trout life history is that the fish spawn in the riffles and those that don't head out to the lake before the water gets too warm die. So they're forced to out migrate to the lake if they want to survive and, and that may select for or perpetuate that type of life history. So we have a couple streams that are pretty marginal. One of them is below, actually below Lake Independence where we don't see any resident trout, but we have seen a couple of large brook trout there in the fall, which kind of would fit with that theory that that warmer water may trigger or make an out migration necessary and if the fish imprint on that area because they were spawned in that area, and they, they may migrate back in there to spawn in the fall. So whether that plays out or pans out, we'll see if, how it works. But, but that's one of the areas where we can use that microchemistry of the maxilla. We're gonna get some of the fish in there. We can, we'll be able to look at those fish and say, yep, this fish was in Lake Superior and it came up in the river. The other interesting thing that adds kind of credence to the idea that harvest may be limiting this coaster brook trout. The, the occurrence of coaster brook trout in Michigan is, we look at where the two populations are. One is Isle Royal, very inaccessible, you know, very limited kind of sport fishing. The other is the Salmon Trout River. That's the only population in the South Shore of Lake Superior. And that's all almost entirely surrounded by private club land. I think there's one road crossing that's accessible to the main part of the river. And so those fish, have been lightly or you know very lightly fished for many years and theoretically that may have allowed those populations to persist whereas the others got knocked out and there was a article oh shoot it's about 1850 or 1850s ish i don't remember exactly but the person there reported that uh coaster brook trout in the marquette area were fished out at that point so there probably weren't a whole lot back then if they think they fished them out 150 years ago with the type of technology they had so it kind of it's it's a con it's an interesting uh, argument hopefully hopefully this will make a difference but it'll be a little while before we find out still today's show is brought to you in part by rapid river knife works home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. Another theory is that the uh, competition with Pacific Salmonids is making it really tough on brook trout. And I think that's pretty well proven that brook trout populations have gone down since these steelhead and coal have gotten in here, but these are natural populations. There's not like we're gonna ever be able to get rid of them. And uh, the neat thing in Minnesota is the regulation they have, they have Pacific salmons in those streams, so they got coho, they got steelhead. 
But with that regulation, they did manage to start bringing back what appear to be coasters. And the other neat thing about that Minnesota study is they did genetics on all their bigger fish and they showed that almost all of them were just, the genetics went right back to the native Minnesota wild brook trout populations. So it wasn't related to any coaster strains that had been stocked and cast or anything like that. So it's kind of cool. When I worked at the Hunt Creek Research Station, they were looking at a competition between steelhead and brown trout. And I think part of why the steelhead outcompeted the resident trout is that they just simply out-reproduced them, you know? A big 10-pound steelhead comes in there and it's got thousands and thousands of eggs and it can just put many more juveniles into the stream than a resident brown or brook trout can, so just because it has more food resources available to grow and, and produce a ton of eggs. That might be why, in part, resident trout populations go down a little bit when there's Great Lakes fish coming in but also some of the resident trout can really grow well like a bigger brown because they're feeding on all those juvenile steelhead eggs and coho eggs and fry and all that kind of stuff. So it it's, adds productivity to the system overall. So there's pros and cons, you know. Yeah, you know, you think of just this stretch, how big the brook trout we've seen are, think about how many eggs they might have in them and then think about this a few cohos we saw and how many eggs they would have. So it's no surprise that we're getting a ton of, a ton of cohos and, and a handful of brook trout. But this historically was a coaster brook trout stream from old records and, uh, and even some current reports from some anglers. So what we're doing here is measuring the uh, discharge of the stream. So basically every foot across the stream we measure the depth and then the velocity of the water and that will allow us to actually calculate how much water is moving down the river in uh, either cubic feet per second or cubic meters per second, however we want to um, look at that data. 1.08, 16 centimeters. We shocked about 1,500 feet. We saw a lot of juvenile coho and a lot of juvenile steelhead, large number of adult coho. 10, 11 brook trout, several nine inchers. Nothing that I would guess is a coaster at this point. 160 coho for a 1,500 foot stretch of stream. So you can see why there's a lot of coho being produced naturally in these rivers. Um, looks like 60 or so rainbows, about 40 or 50 sculpin, 15 to 20 adult coho salmon, and they were in here to spawn. Uh, and then a few other species. One interesting one was the burbot, which is, lives in lakes appear to cold water fish. And we often see it in some of our trout streams. So it looked good. Obviously there's great lakes spawning salmonids that come in here. And maybe someday there'll be some great lakes brook trout that'll come in here. But. I also had the opportunity to tag along on a similar electrofishing mission, this time in a boat on Little Baby Knot for walleyes. So the boat has two anodes off the front and we'll motor over the, these shallow areas and hopefully we'll stun a few fish. They'll be attracted to that field, swim up towards the anodes and we'll be able to dip them up and then uh, we'll take them over to uh, Dr. Eiserman and, and crew and they'll put the tags in them. When the water gets cold like this, the walleyes will move up into shallow areas. They'll come up and forage in these shallow areas and are much uh, more vulnerable in the electrofishing gear. We've got a project we're working with the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point and the Wisconsin DNR and um, trying to better understand the sources of walleye to the population in Green Bay as a whole. We're tagging 18 plus inch walleye with uh, acoustic telemetry tags. And we have different areas of the, the bay kind of cordoned off with curtains of receivers. So for example, we're at, we're at the mouth of the Rapid and Whitefish River. We have a couple of receivers in each river. And if a fish with one of these tags swims by that receiver, it pings the receiver and will tell us that the fish went up the river. We got funding to put antenna rays at most all of the major tributaries to uh, Green Bay. Where the Door Peninsula cuts off Green Bay from the main basin of Lake Michigan, we have antenna rays all along that chain of islands so we can see if a fish leaves the main basin. And then we have the southern part of the bay, the central part of the bay, and the northern parts of the bay cordoned off with the curtains of arrays. And then it's also Big Bay and Little Bay to Knock, uh, Little Bay to Knock at Saunders Point in Gladstone, which is where the bay kind of narrows up. So we can see a fish move past any of those points. Plan is to, to tag 
a hundred walleyes in the southern part of the bay, in the central part of the bay, and in the northern part of the bay, and then see where those fish are going throughout the year, um, where they're spawning, when they're leaving spawning areas, um, if they're going, if the fish from the southern part of the bay are going to the central part of the bay or the northern part of the bay. So kind of tracking the movement of all these fish over the basically almost the course of their lives, you know, four or five years. So we're out here hoping to get some fish before they start moving into the areas where they spawn. So at the end of the year, the crew from the Hammond Bay Biological Station, who are also collaborators on this project, and they've got pinpoint GPS, so they go in there um, late in the season and they pull up those uh, antennas and they download the information and then they'll um, redeploy them next spring. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you in part by Crest, your Northwoods neighborhood store. Oh, oh a bigger sucker! <laughs> uh, versatile fish in Michigan. They live in warm water rivers or trout streams, especially the ones that are a little bit warmer, and then lakes. We do know a fair amount about the movements of walleye in, in uh, the bays and knock, especially a little bay to knock. We've been well, doing jaw tagging studies since 1988. A jaw tag is a a metal band and we clamp it around the jaw of the fish. It has a number on it and it has our contact information on it. When anglers catch that fish, they report it to us. And then we can find out how long the fish had been out at large before it was caught. And that will give us some idea about what the, the mortality rate, so what, at what rate the walleye are harvested. But the, the anglers will also report where they caught the fish. From that, we've been able to see how the movement patterns of walleye have changed over the years. In Little Bay and Knock, we've been tagging at the head of the bay at the Rapid River Public Access since 1988. For the first five or six years, um, during the period of July to September, all the walleye, tagged walleyes that were reported, on average, they were all caught north of Saunders Point. And then the second five or six years, so you get into the mid to late 90s, it was kind of about the same, right around Saunders Point or further north. You know, and some were caught further in the bay and some were caught a little bit further out. But on average, that's where they were. The dry synod mussels, zebra mussels, and later the quaggas moved in in the late 80s, early right, right around 1990, and the effects really started to show up strongly in our sampling of the forage fish community starting in about 2000 or so. You could really see the forage fish populations tail off. So when we look at our walleye tag returns from about 1998 to about 2006, on average, those fish were caught down around just north of Escanaba. And then for the next six year period, on average, the fish were caught about close to 10 miles south of Escanaba. So after spawning, these fish make a pretty quick movement, most of them, and they go out in the bay, into the main part of the bay, where they're less available to the, to the person with the 12 or 14 foot boat. And so the small boat fishery here for walleye isn't quite as good as it used to be. But we still do catch decent numbers of walleye in our, in our assessment gear in this area during the summer. We've definitely seen changes in the movement of walleye over the years, and so it'll be very interesting to see how this survey, I imagine it will corroborate that information to some degree, but we'll <laughs> learn a lot more about walleye movements from this survey, and we'll be learning about walleye from different areas throughout the bay, so it'll be really very interesting. That's not a walleye. That is a big steelhead. <laughs> well, we didn't have luck connecting with any walleyes, electrofishing, and we're heading back to the dock, and. Fortunately, uh, Dr. Dan Eiserman, they did catch one walleye in their uh, gill net that they had set out for a half an hour. And so they're gonna implant the transmitter in that fish and we'll have to work on our plan B for sampling walleyes. Dan Eiserman, I'm the unit leader for the Wisconsin Cooperative Fishery Research Unit at the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. So we uh, pop a dorsal spine so we can get an age estimate. And the fin clip is for genetics. And then the loop tag says a hundred dollar reward because if we can get the transmitter back, we could either we can reuse it, and then the yellow part of it is the temperature logger, which uh, we have to get back to download. It's just a handheld unit down there. It's the same type of unit your doctor might recommend you using if you had muscle spasms. And uh, we've got paired electrodes, so two positive, two negative. girl. So it's a acoustic transmitter that'll it pings so we can listen for it 
and it'll last about four years. So if we have receivers all out in Green Bay. There's a couple up in the Rapid, a couple up in the Whitefish River. So if the fish passes by those locations, it gives us a date and a time when the fish was there. And we're really trying to see where they end up going to spawn. And that's why we were trying to tag them in the fall. So they're kind of out in the out in the lake habitat and then we're trying to see how many of them actually come into these rivers or go to different areas or never come into the river at all. The advantage of the electro anesthesia, like all of the chemicals, I mean, you gotta wait 21 days to release them. When we did the surgery trials last year, the recovery times when you get below 50 degree water were really long. So the fish would be in the tank for 10, 11 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes before they'd right themselves and start swimming. It worked really well. Yeah. And at warmer water, it's a lot better. The recovery times aren't as bad, but this is almost instant. Once wow. they come off the table, we usually only got to leave them in the tank for a little while and they're ready to go. Feel free to join us on Facebook or visit us at 906outdoors.com. And while you're there, be sure to sign up to get on the 906 Outdoors email list. We'll send you an occasional email with tips, recipes, and more. You'll also be eligible for giveaways just for being on the list. Thanks for watching, and we invite you to join us next week for another adventure right here on 906 Outdoors.